I love how you, you frame this as a choice because inaction is also a choice. Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us this evening. So this is the first in a series of Snake River Dinner Hour webinars that we're going to be doing. For our fourth Snake River Dinner Hour. For our fifth Snake River Dinner Hour. We're gonna discuss the largest river restoration opportunity in history and the solutions you can find together if we have the courage to have that conversation. I know that that's not like the technical answer, but that's the human answer. Those of us that are involved in uh, protecting salmon is really protected in a way of life that is balanced. We have an opportunity to turn this around. We know what the need is. The science all fundamentally points in the same direction. In Oregon and Washington and Idaho, there are two million people who fish. And it's also one of the best transfers of wealth from urban communities to rural communities. It's, it's a complex problem with not just one solution. You have to look at the whole life cycle of the salmon. We have tried really everything else for decades and decades, billions of dollars. I've worked on this issue in Washington, D.C. for a long time. There has never been this level of interest from people that have not supported dam removal in the past. I think farmers have a pretty good story to tell on that front uh, that doesn't always get told of, of how efficient we are. I mean, we all eat off of those fields, and I would never minimize the importance of that productivity and the work that you do. The way I look at it is we engineered our way into this and it's an engineering challenge to get out of it. You know, in the 20th century, we really, we thought big and we did big things. I believe we can still do those big things. Fishermen are experts in failed mitigations. Salmon hatcheries are what we have now. They're a sad little crutch. But, but I hope everyone knows our goal is the same. We want farming and fish to both be thriving. We're all invited to the farm. I don't know if all 130 plus participants heard that. That's right, free potato, guaranteed free potato. <laughs> right, left, farmer, fish advocate. Everyone's going to have to come together because if that's not the case, it, it doesn't happen. We can't be the people who allowed salmon to go extinct. That cannot be our legacy. The hydro system itself is the backbone of our energy system. These dams in particular have an environmental legacy that cuts to the root, and it's why we're we're having this conversation, why it's such an important conversation. Where we talk about what are your fears? Well, how can we address that? How can we solve that? The fear mongering over rate increases really perplexes me because we have been replacing aging infrastructure all across this country forever. What we're looking at right now presents a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. I'm excited about it. And I wanted to add that there's some really good news about this, and that is the immense economic opportunity for the rural communities in our region. I can probably double the amount of generation that I have from my facility right now with very little cost. Truly enormous changes are upon us. <laughs> People like the lights to stay on and the bills to stay low and move on to the next subject. It is going to be hard, but I feel like we uh, we always rise to the occasion to solve big challenges. That is how our democracy works. It is as strong as we make it. And a big part of my job is making sure that folks know how to participate in a lot of these big decisions and make sure that your perspectives and your questions get heard by folks that are making these decisions. How they can engage in a, a process to identify a durable path forward that includes a lot of the elements we've talked about here. And one of the things that I really value in these dinner series is our ability to come together and talk about some of these things that are hard conversations, right? Those dams went in about 50 years ago and those wheat farms have been there longer. It's a question of cost on both sides. Yes, it'll be a serious investment to re-expand rail, but it's a continual investment in the barge side. It's over $140 million a year to maintain these dams. A fair number of people here in Eastern Washington that can't imagine life without barges. But truthfully, I don't care how my grain gets to market. I ship it the most economical way I can. Again, kind of going back in time, there was a rail line to every one of these small towns. Those have all been pulled up. What I always wonder is most wheat farmers in the West don't have the lower snake as an option. And so, do they already deal with that captive shipper problem and how do they solve it? The rail lines that exist today, whether along the snake or up country, have 
what I would consider to be plenty of capacity. They're running at most one train a day in each direction. I feel that if we can solve this rail issue, we can get the infrastructure in place and farmers will get on board. You know, change is not easy. It's not easy for anybody. They've adapted their farms. They're farming differently than their grandfathers were as Brian mentioned, so it's not impossible. You know, it's not always easy to talk about the nitty gritty details of this, but really appreciate it that we have this public forum here for folks to listen and to learn more. I'm loving watching this, the action from Giles. Like this is research in action and it's really exciting to see. Unfortunately, we have waited so long and this population is so critically small and is one oil spill away from extinction. When Tahlequah carried her baby for over a thousand miles, and it was broadcast all over the world. And it was like the orca was speaking to all of us. The Southern residents go down to the Columbia River to feed. And we have yes. studied this and they've got a habit. We've tracked it. We also know that the whales hove off eating the salmon that were the biggest salmon. As far as we know, the Snake River salmon, Chinook salmon would have been the biggest salmon on the West Coast. It's going to come down to a decision by people. It's clear to me that we have an imperative to figure out how we open the gateway to give them their best chance. With all the modeling that I've done on this population, the whales have told us mathematically and with their behavior, they have nothing left to give. If our salmon go away, not only does Quahomishton go away, us as Lummi people go away. You can't have a salmon people without salmon.